Ladies and gentlemen, good evening from Massachusetts, and welcome to this year's first webinar, organized jointly by the Consulate General of Greece in Boston and Boston Lycion Elinidon, the latter one of the oldest nonprofit organizations for the promotion of Hellenic culture in New England. I am Evriviki Yorgandeli, art historian and numismatist of late antiquity and Byzantium, and the Greek of the diaspora. It is my distinct pleasure to moderate today's panel discussion, commemorating 200 years since the Greek Revolution. A seminal moment in European history, a bloodied war with immeasurable sacrifices at the end of freedom, the revolution resulted in the birth of a modern sovereign state, Greece, almost 400 years after the fall of Byzantium to the Ottomans. To honor the continuous and vital role of women for the preservation of Hellenic identity and the advancement of the economic, political, religious, and social life, from Byzantium all the way to the 19th century revolution, and from there to the modern Greek society, we are joined by three distinguished speakers, leaders in their respective discipline, areas of expertise, and industry. They will help us decipher the role of women as innovators, masters of religious diplomacy, scholars, benefactors, disruptors, and entrepreneurs in Greece's long history. But before introducing them, I would like to ask our hosts, Stratos Efthimiou, Consul General of Greece in Boston, and Irini Savas, President of the Boston Lycion Elinidon to open the event. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I suppose I'm uh, the person who brings diversity to this panel. Uh, it is a great uh, honor and pleasure to be with you uh, today in a webinar celebrating women in uh, Greek history. I think that the time is very uh, appropriate as we celebrate uh, the Greek Revolution's bicentennial. Uh, and uh, this is a milestone that offers us a great opportunity to reflect on uh, great personalities who left their stamp on uh, Greek history. And I'm uh, particularly excited because today's panel features four internationally recognized Greek women from Boston's academic and entrepreneurial community. Professor Ioli Kalamvrezu, Professor Maria Kundura from Australia, entrepreneur Marina Hadjopoulos, and Dr. Evridiki uh, Yorgandeli. They are all incredibly accomplished uh, in their respective fields. And uh, on behalf of the Hellenic Republic, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to them for their contributions to our community, uh, to Greece, and for their contributions to the advancement of science. Uh, finally, a big thank you to Sofia Kustas, Ileana Safka, and Irene Savas, and all the great members of the Boston uh, Lycion Elinidon. It is a great pleasure working with you. Thank you. Haristo. Well, greetings. I'm Irene Savas, president of the Boston Lycion Elinidon. We are joyous to share this special event with you this evening. It is the inspiration of two members of our board of directors, Iliana Safka and Sofia Kustas, whom we commend for so diligently and so successfully bringing this to fruition. Along with them, we acknowledge and thank the Consulate of Greece in Boston for its ongoing support, and especially the enthusiastic collaboration of our Consul General Stratos Estimio. This is the highlight of the Boston Lycanetti Needham's year long programming in salute of the 200th anniversary of the Greek Revolution. The Boston Lycanetti Needham is a voluntary organization. As evidenced by our name, we focus, although not exclusively, on women. Our entire performing dance troupe, uh, adorned in an authentic attire, is probably the most prominent manifestation. However, we are engaged in and dedicated to the preservation of all aspects of traditional Greek culture, true to our mission 
as one of only two branches in, in the United States of the esteemed Legion Genetinism of Greece. With thanks to our impressive group of panelists from whom we will hear now, I turn this back to you, Evidiki. Thank you so very much, uh, Evidiki. The format of today's panel consists of short presentations by our speakers, followed by an introduction to the mission and wonderful activities of the Boston Lichionelli Nidon by board directors Sofia Kusta and Iliana Savka. And we will conclude with a Q&A session to which you are warmly invited to contribute by submitting your questions, observations, and reflections. Now, a short introduction to our speakers. Yoli Calavresu is the Dumbarton Oaks Professor of Byzantine Art at Harvard University, Senior Fellow and Senior Research Associate at Dumbarton Oaks, and Trustee at the Cyprus Research Institute, among other things. A prolific scholar and a wonderful mentor and academic leader, Professor Calavresu has researched, taught, and published on an array of subjects with emphasis on early Christian and Byzantine art and material culture. Among her areas of expertise, I would like to highlight the relationship between church and state, the role of King David and Alexander in Byzantium's visual culture, the cult of the Virgin Mary and women in Byzantium. The latter became the subject of a highly acclaimed 2002 publication and exhibition project entitled Byzantine Women and Their World. So this first project, to explore the lives of Byzantine women through their representation in material and literary culture still serves almost 20 years later as a strong reference point for studying women in Byzantium. This evening, Professor Calavresu will be presenting aspects of the roles, rights, social mobility and visibility of women in Byzantine society. Maria Kundura, writer and academic is the professor of literature and transnational culture at Emerson College, where she also serves as special advisor to the provost. The author of at least two monographs, and I read one, I'm going to the next one, Maria, now, The Greek Idea and Transnational Culture and Transnational Identity. Professor Kundura has published numerous studies on modernity, aesthetics, ethics, and politics. She has also been instrumental in showcasing in the Boston area, the best of the Greek artistic production. This evening, she will be presenting two extraordinary female movers and shakers, the 18th century English aristocrat, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, and the Greek proto-feminist, Kaliroi Paren, founder of the Lycion Elinidon in 1911. Last but not least, I would like to present Marina Hadzopoulos, entrepreneur, president of the Hellenic Innovation Network and award-winning author. The board chair of Levitronics Technologies, Marina Hadzopoulos has held many leadership positions in highly successful industries, such as 3D printing, laser-based aesthetics, performance apparel, luxury tea, to mention a few. Her unwavering support of Greece and Cyprus and faith in the country's economic potential drives her every action. She sits on the National Board of Research and Innovation for the Republic of Cyprus, the advisory board of MIT Enterprise Forum Greece, and Eurobank's AGG incubator. Again, some of the many. Having said all this, my first encounter with Marina was through her articles, her essays, and short stories, which I have very much enjoyed reading on her site, windingstreet.com, as well as in periodicals and literary journals. This evening, Marina Hadzopoulos will argue why technology startups are game changers for 21st century Greece, a country that during the 20th century idealized job security, civil servants, and clear roadmaps. What is the role of Greek female entrepreneurs in this technology revolution that is currently sweeping Greece? 
Thank you. And we should start with Professor Calabresu. Good evening, everyone. Um, as an art historian, you will see that I have images that I'm going to present to you today. And uh, in the 10 sort of minutes that I have to my disposal, I would like to present the world of women before the Ottoman conquest, that is uh, the centuries of late antiquity and Byzantium up to the 15th century. I am, so to speak, giving you the background of the culture and civilization of the Greek Middle Ages, where women had a dynamic presence in that society, which outlasted the Ottoman occupation and remained part of the Greek culture to resurface later in the creation of a new Greek state. The identi uh, identifiable women those that we know with names from that world, a culture of more than a thousand years are mainly empresses and other aristocratic women. Histories and chronicles record their names and their activities since they were related to the imperial court and its distinguished members. Their inclusion in these textual records was the result of their unusual positions or behavior or political situation that required their presence. There are several I could mention here, and these are the well-known ones, as for example, the most famous, that of Theodora that you see in this mosaic. Um, but there are also several other ones, and this is where most of the published materials on So quite an effective figure. She was rather brave also and impressed even her husband. Um, or other empresses were given power because of political circumstances and were needed to hold the throne. For example, they I think we have a technical issue. Um, may I suggest uh, while Professor Calabresu uh, resumes in, uh, should we should we wait or would you like us to? Should we? Uh, So let's let's continue if that's okay, and I will try to get in touch with Dr. Calabreso and try to troubleshoot, and uh, we'll be right back. Okay, so we're grateful, Sophia. Yeah. So uh, because uh, the chronological sequence uh, takes us now. Oh, here is. Yeah. Holly. <laughs> No worries. This is the real life of, of uh, the Zoom world, right? We're all used to it by now. We all know the ups and downs of it. So, 
Okay, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I just to my thing is so I um, I was saying I was saying that other women uh, were also uh, depicted in various ways, but this is an exceptional case where we have two women holding the globe. Um, Another woman that is important to mention is that of Theodora of the ninth century, another Theodora, uh, who was successful in putting an end to iconoclasm and reintroducing the icons of wall paintings in churches. This is a really important matter. Um, in this scene here from an illustrated chronicle of Theodora's mother, by the name of Theoctisti, uh, we see her introducing secretly the grand, her the granddaughters, uh, the veneration of icons. I think it's a nice for um, Here we have a record of three generations of women who respecting tradition played a most important role for the Orthodox church and its religious uh, ceremonial rites matters of fundamental importance for the ages to come. Um, a gold coin shows her, her husband, Theophilus, and those th that were of age at the time. This is also an unusual issue of a coin. Uh, Professor Calabresu, uh, yes. would, you, would you share your presentation again? Oh, it's not shared now? It's not shared. We would love to see the uh, the coin you mentioned. Not only the coin, the image is even more important. Okay, so I'm sorry about this. I have updated, I guess. When is that now visible? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So here you see, you can see her for some time because I'm reading something else with no images. <laughs> and it's on the, there, on the bottom. Um, so, as I said, this is like three generations now uh, depicted here that did something for the Orthodox uh, church and the religious ceremonies that we have um, in the Eastern church. Now, another famous woman is the daughter of Alexis Komnenos, who in the 12th uh, century left us a text that's called the Iliad, think of Iliad, right? a historical and biographical text of her father's accomplishments. This is a most unusual activity, unique as a woman author, although girls did learn to read. There was a second woman, Cassiani or Cassia, uh, a contemporary of Theodora who ended the iconoclasm, who became a famous hymnographer, poet and composer. Her hymns are still chanted today, <clears throat> especially one on Holy Week, or hymnus Cassianis. In contrast, there are hard records describing the everyday woman. Uh, some saints' life make some remarks, but that's not hardly enough. So if we want to find out something about the life of women in the cities or in the countryside, we have to reconstruct their life and place in that society from the material and visual uh, evidence that have not too much. The artifacts have themselves become, so to speak, the independent records of their historical reality. They are objects of uh, private, the private realm, clothes, jewelry, household furnishings, implements used for grooming and uh, sort of health matters. And these give due a sense of their individuality, which however, I will not be more obvious to understand. Though, um, through um, uh, existing representations, I will give you a sense of the activities and responsibilities of women in the Byzantine society. So, ideological norms 
posited that the proper realm for the woman's activities and responsibilities was the home, a private space or place, and her family. That, these were her responsibilities. After courting or arranged marriages, the marriage was considered a partnership. The couple um, would live together and start a family. The raising and upbringing of children were her responsibility. The woman would dowry consisting of household items, clothes, etc., but also property. The dowry um, always remained the property of the woman and as property owners, she had an important position in the household. The marriage could be also resolved at some, you know, if needed through a divorce. Divorce also initiate if there was adultery, abuse, or if the husband had been taken prisoner and had not returned after three years. In these cases, uh, the woman had the right to keep her dowry. Also, in cases if they were widowed, was this, uh, the same law existed. This law allowed. There's also some circumstances. Um, although the home was considered the place to be, women clearly went out and the economic realities of everyday life engaged women in various activities. They had a number of uh, possibilities for work. For example, uh, beyond what is cloth making, um, that is spinning and weaving, as you see here in two of these images, even the Virgin is spinning there on the right, uh, she could also sell her textiles. These uh, could be curtains, um, blankets, textiles for clothing and, all, and the like. And unfortunately, something happened to the slide on the, the image on the left and it disappeared. These are some examples of this kind of uh, weavings. No, um, we have information that suggests the existence of uh, guilt-like institutions in the 11th century where women were members as cloth workers. Known are, for example, the silk textile workers of the famous workshops of Thebes. Um, other occupations we know um, are those that still today are professions mainly of women. They could, for example, be uh, nurses and midwives. Here is seen from giving birth by midwife. She's praying to God on the left to have a child and the birth of the child is shown on the right. That's a quite unusual image. You know, you, we don't see image giving, uh, women giving birth in, birth in general uh, anywhere, but we have several of those. They also took care of the immediate needs, uh, the washing of the child, for example, uh, and also the other priority that was to take care of the woman um, that uh, just gave birth. And here you see the lejona, as we say uh, in Greece, who needed immediate attention with uh, food that was brought to her, uh, as you can see here. And also in this image, you can see the textiles uh, that decorate the room, um, uh, the crib, the bed, uh, the various textiles that probably these women also uh, produced. Other occupations were innkeepers or sellers of products in the markets, mainly agriculture, but they also were um, also responsible for much of the actual agricultural work when living in the countryside. Here you see a rare image depicting women in the fields picking grapes and harvesting grain from the 11th century. On the right, two ivory panels or little plaques from a box that show the partnership uh, between and, and the work together of Adam and Eve as an ideal couple that was presented. Uh, he is harvesting with a sickle or scythe the grain and she carries it on her shoulders. Uh, the bundle of it. Um, in the other, she's um, uh, helping to, 
he is actually forging and she's helping with our heart. These are great examples of the participation of women in what we might call the workforce nowadays. Um, there are also other occupations as for example, dancers that could be uh, hired for festivities and parades. Um, you can see on the small ivory box, there's a, uh, the dancer is accompanied by musicians. However, dancing was also the activity of the women in general, uh, not sort of hired dancers, but performed in celebrations of weddings, religious feasts, panigiria, and so on. At the court, too, dancing was part of celebrating, for example, military victories. Here, the women of the court, as it was a tradition, are dancing in a circle, wearing fancy hats and silk dresses with long sleeves, as you can see. Uh, present today. I hope to have shown you a side of the life and participation of women in business and society that still needs to be studied. Further, we need to know much more and to be, to be brought out for understanding the courageous Greek vision of the war of independence. What led to that? Uh, their independence within our own beliefs and visions, the kind of individuals we wish to be. These are our agents, so to speak, and they have deep roots. Women fostered it, knowledge, beliefs, customs, passed from generation to generation, from mother or grandmother to their children uh, to maintain this civilization that passed the strong, intelligent individuals we recognize today. My last slide is to show you that they had not forgotten also their own ancient past, which I did not address at all today where lots of women are represented. But I can show you that a Byzantine woman with pendant crosses or choose one with a beautiful Aphrodite attending to her hair. Thank you. And sorry for all the mishaps. Thank you so very much, uh, uh, Professor Calabresu. And for from you, I would like now to let's move from Byzantium all the way to the 18th century and an English woman, Maria. Hello, thank you, Vridiki, and thank you, Yoli. That was um, wonderful to hear and also to see the context of uh, some of the things that um, the people that I'm gonna be talking, the women that I'm gonna be talking about were looking and were considering. Um, I'm, I'm offering two examples and one of them is not a Greek woman, she's an English woman, but you will understand why I'm offering her uh, as I present. Um, um, Lady Mary not only uh, dressed as a Greek, but she was very keen in representing uh, Greeks. So, um, so in the early 18th century, so one of my examples is uh, an early 18th century English aristocrat, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who was the wife of the first English ambassador to the Ottoman court, and whose early 18th century representations of Greece set the foundations of 19th century Philhellenism. The second is a late 19th century, early 20th century Greek feminist, Kaliroi Paren, who is familiar to friends of Likio Elinidon as she is its 1911 founder. Bookends to the Greek Revolution, both women's work reconciles the East-West barbarism, civilization, tradition, modernity, polarity at the core of discussions on modern Greece. Lady Mary, in her embassy letters, reconciles these polarities through narrative means. As I argued in my 2007 book, The Greek Idea, her early 1700s account of Greeks was integral to the formation of mid 18th century literary genre of realism, which is the means through which we still tell most of our stories today. 
Calero y Paren, through the Ephemerida Don Girion, that she founded in 1887, reconciles these polarities through social means. As Eleni Varica argued in her 1987 brilliant book, I Exegersi Don Girion, Paren and the women of the Ephemerida Don Girion changed the social norms imposed on them by using the newly independent modern Greece's desire to be European to develop an autonomous voice of their own. Let me begin with Lady Mary. Her embassy letters were first published in 1763 in an unauthorized pirated version after they were stolen from her on, a sh on the ship back to England. The official confirmed uh, from her estate version of the letters was published in 1803. She wrote her letters and journals between 1708 and 1720 during her travels to and stay in Constantinople, which was not typical, uh, I'm sorry, during her stay in Constantinople. Um, equipped with a literary knowledge of ancient Greeks, she had an excellent education in classics, which was not typical of even of aristocratic ladies of her time, Lady Mary earnestly confirms their likeness with them and the then contemporary Greeks that she encountered. As she writes in her letter to the poet Alexander Pope in 1717, commenting on his recently published translation of Homer, I read over your Homer here with an infinite pleasure and find several passages explained that I did not before entirely comprehend the beauty of. Many of the customs and much of the dress then in fashion being yet retained. And I don't wonder to find more remains here of an age so distant. For her, the remains here of an age so distant were not those ancient ruins, which is what later mid 18th century travelers focused on, but of an ancient people in the present. The continuity between ancient and modern Greeks that her letters helped establish among her English readers set the ground not only for Philhellenism, but also for modern Greek accounts of their history. Adamantios Koreis, for example, in his Paris 1803 report on the present state of civilization in Greece, also invoked continuity as he told the history of a nation that did not yet exist to a European audience, he was asking to help make it real by strategically reminding his audience that their own um, is the Greeks' past and future, Koraïs ensured their support for Greece, a Greece that his account represents as both modern and as the original, hence constant, source of civilization. Now, earlier portrayals of Greeks, the most prestigious being Richard Knowles' 1603, General History of the Turks, which was revised in 1679, contained the usual lamentation about Greece's past glory, the degeneration of the Greeks and the yoke of the Turks, along with some interesting theories about what happened to the Greeks. Lady Mary makes a distinction between her account and Knowles's by telling the recipients of her letters that hers was based on experience. Hers was an actual eyewitness, not imaginary encounter with Greeks. She also establishes her account from, sorry, distinguishes her account from that of other tales of travel. As she notes in her letter, her letter to her sister, unlike them, her desire was not to entertain her readers, but to tell the truth. Now in mid 18th century England, the time of the first publication of the letters, truth was an, a very charged term. The then emerging genre of fiction and its category of the real with its shift from truth as historical accuracy to truth as mimetic simulation or from truth as fact to truth as fiction made it so. Detail was the marker of difference between the two. The truth of fact was less detail while the truth of fiction was more detail. It is what made it real. So the detailed accounts of Greeks in the embassy letters made them real, that is real fictions in the eyes of their readers and helped them become the measure of not only English, but also Greek culture's identity. Lady Mary and all the Philhellenes for whom her work was necessary reading, saw this culture and identity as continuous and universal. This is what made Greeks a utopian common property, which led 
Percy B. Shelley to declare we're all Greeks in his poem Elas. Now, Caliroi Paren and the women of the Ephemeride of Sinton Girion, believing in this continuity, wanted to restore Greek women in the place that belongs to them in it. Paren, was also, who also worked as a journalist in major newspapers like Estia, Asti, and Acropolis, collected a large number of permanent contributors for the newspaper. Many were women she met while teaching in girls' schools in the Greek community still under Ottoman rule and in Russia. They contributed articles from various locations and helped increase new subscriptions. This network and the fact that Paren used her own funds to ensure publication was the cause of the longevity of the newspaper. It began as a weekly in 1887, became bi-weekly from 1907 to 1917 when it ceased publication. At its height in 1892, the newspaper had a circulation of 5,000 with a wide geographic distribution. Now using the barbarism civilization binary, editorials and articles in the Ephemerida Don Quirion argued that women in their collaborative work, and we saw images of that in Nioli's presentation, represent progress and civilization, while men, while they, with their war and violence, are in the camp of barbarism. Their reading of the past, however, was not focused only on the critique of a male-centric point of view, nor only on women's equality, which they championed. While constantly challenging the idealizing of violence in history, they offered alternative human values whose historic foundations um, and initiators were women. Women, thank God, woman, thank God, was not a soldier. At November 15th, 1887 editorial states, it is enough that this war happy, fueled by the greed of the powerful phase be led by men. When need demands, however, there will always be a Bobulina, Suliotises, and others like them. Interestingly, what the editorial focused on from Bobulina was not only her leadership in the Greek War of Independence, but also her intervention after the conquest of Tripoli to secure the, secure, to the, safety, to secure the safety of the women of Urshid Pasha's harem by saving them from being the spoils of war of Greek and Albanian soldiers. Illustrating their vision of continuity, if Merida Tungirion's work to restore women's history did not refer only to the near past of the revolution, but all of history, ancient Greek, Roman antiquity, Byzantine Empire, the Ottoman Empire, to this end, they formed a group of specialists in women's history, among them Sapho Leondias, Ekaterini Samarjidu, Sotiria Liberti, Eleni Georgiadu, and Paren herself, and they're all listed um, in the album of extraordinary Greek women, Left, Ex of Onelinism, a supplement to the um, January 10th, 1893 uh, publication of the newspaper. And I'm concluding slowly. Their exploration of the past to reconstruct women's history allowed the writers of Fimeril Tungirion to conceive of women as a separate category with its own contribution to Greek culture and struggles and its own historical interest mixing myth and history from ancient goddesses to the Virgin Mary, to Byzantine empresses like the ones again we've seen from the Olis presentation, to Bubulina and the Suliotises, they use female figures whose main function is their visibility to create a narrative, dare I say a fiction, as Mythistorima is Greek word for fiction, that challenges the one rendering them invisible. In that Mythistorima, Athena, is not the hermaphrodite goddess who sprung fully formed and armed from her father's head. She's polios, she's ergani, the symbol of wisdom, peace, prosperity, the characteristics that she inherited from her mother Metis, who was consumed by Zeus. Her transformation into Promachos meant the defeat of these characteristics, which led to her forgetting, to their forgetting. Through education, primarily, the women of Himerida Tungirion work to create the space for their remembrance, not as a memorial, a mnemio, but as lived culture. This space, the right to it, and the rights that it entailed, in their view, returned women to their real place, not only in Greek history, but also global history. Parents 14th of May, 1900 account in the Ephemerida, of her attendance of the 1893 International Women's Congress in Chicago offers a glimpse of that vision. 
The thousands there were from all over the world, she writes. They were to Anthos des Gynekias Tretias, the flower of the women's army, that changed the look of the new world, ilaxe tinopsi to neo cosmo. The new world that Paren is referring to was not only the US, the location of the conference, or Greece, her nation, with the various uh, global femin feminist networks she collaborated with, sent doctors and nurses to join the few Greek women doctors in the 1897 war, but also the future she envisioned. It was a future in which women were not only the subject of, but also the agents of change. In that world, once she worked to build in Greece, history and its continuity in the present was not a nostalgia for the past, but a utopian anticipation. And that utopian anticipation, Marina is actually gonna fulfill with her presentation in which she's speaking about the future that Paren was envisioning. So Marina, up to you. Wow, uh, that was great, thank you. Um, okay, so we're, we're gonna jump around a little bit in time, but um, just by way of context, a revolution is a radical and often sudden change in society. And what's happening today in Greece with technology startups is nothing short of a revolution. But going back to history, entrepreneurship has been going on since before 3000 BC, when the Cycladic civilization built ships for barter trading of marble, silver, and other minerals in exchange for agricultural goods. Invention is at the heart of innovation and entrepreneurship. And some technological innovations that are credited to the ancient Greeks include the truss roof, crane, gears, the Archimedes screw, and other such mechanical devices. Successful technology entrepreneurs share some characteristics. They are independent thinkers who see opportunity by identifying holes in the market, which are unserved by the current products and services. As such, they're leaders, not followers. They are so risk tolerant and driven that they're willing to risk failure in order to achieve their goals. They're scrappy and they hustle to make each milestone aggressively pushing forward without waiting for perfection. They're willing to drive ahead without a roadmap and make decisions with incomplete information. They don't need rules and they don't wait for permission or for someone else to tell them what to do. In fact, they might even have a bit of a rebellious streak, except that their objective is not to topple governments, but to topple incumbents in the marketplace. So some of you might be thinking, wow, this sounds kind of familiar. Uh, if we analyze the Greek ethos, we recognize so many of these attributes. Greeks think for themselves, they hustle, they like to work for themselves, and they really don't need rules. They even have a bit of a rebellious side, which is exemplified during the annual celebration of Ohi Day, the day the Greeks said no to Mussolini's request to occupy parts of Greece. These characteristics, whether they're part of the culture or the Greek DNA, doesn't really matter, but they have fueled a surging interest in and an inclination towards startups, particularly tech startups. This interest in startups began during the economic crisis when youth unemployment peaked at over 50% in Greece. As a result, the aspirations of young Greeks shifted, as um, we heard earlier, from the desire for the supposedly secure employment in the government to the inherently risky business of creating or joining a tech startup. Why would one consider such a path? Well, there can be many reasons like solving a problem, creating jobs or socioeconomic mobility. And to give you an understanding of the importance of startups on the economy, startups which are less than five years old create nearly all of the net new jobs in the American economy. That's really an astounding factor. And it's true even during economic downturns. This is why entrepreneurship is a complete game changer. It's a revolution for any growing economy. While Greece has already seen some exits of tech startups, there is an even greater pool of opportunity in what we call deep tech. This is the kind of long-term research coming out of universities and research centers that will require years of development to commercialize. Historically, Greek researchers have been very successful at obtaining EU grants for their original work, but there was so much emphasis on publications and there was little attention paid to actually commercializing the technology. 
These kinds of startups take longer to mature, but they ultimately generate tremendous value. With a growing interest in technology transfer at universities and research centers today, it's only a matter of time before we see these deep tech startups start to take shape in Greece. Greece has had a long history of interest in math and science, and women have had a role. The school which Pythagoras founded was open to women, and his wife and daughters taught at the school even after he died. Theano, his wife, is said to have written treatises on mathematics, physics, medicine, and psychology. Today, as a result of the job opportunities of the future, which are in computer science and technology, there's a greater focus from school through university on STEM science, technology, engineering, and math, especially for girls and women. This encouragement of girls in STEM is critical because it's the young girls that are encouraged to stick with their interest in math and science, who ultimately will fill the pipeline for universities and later fill positions in tech companies. Thankfully, there's greater attention being paid to gender diversity in universities, tech accelerators, and even the boardrooms. There has never been a better time to be a girl or a woman in STEM. And all these efforts are making tech entrepreneurship a viable uh, aspiration for girls and women in Greece. Already there are notable Greek women founders who serve as wonderful role models for the younger girls. One example of a Greek tech entrepreneur is Ioana Angelidaki, co-founder and CMO of InstaShop, a, gr a grocery delivery app. The first startup that she and her partner worked on wasn't going anywhere. So they shifted to online sh shopping. And this is one of the key characteristics that you see in an entrepreneur, which is this ability to accept failure and move forward from it and not be um, just completely discouraged. Today, InstaShop has around half a million users in five markets and they're profitable. In the biggest deal in Greece to date, it was acquired for $360 million last August. In deeper tech, we have Marianti Fragopoulou, founder of Herado, who's a nuclear physicist who invented an innovative system for radiation measurement. She's collaborating with important research organizations such as NASA in the United States. And these are just two examples, but there are many, many more. Technology entrepreneurship provides women with opportunity for leadership, management, creativity, and ultimately the most important thing, economic independence, which is at the root of women's empowerment. A little known secret of entrepreneurship is that in the early days, it actually offers tremendous flexibility for a young mother in terms of schedule. I know because I was a young mother growing my family along with the business. Of course, it's still many hours of work, but you have control over your time. Being a tech entrepreneur is not easy. It's a lot of hard work, but it's hugely gratifying. Tech entrepreneurship is about creating a new product that solves a problem in the world. This can have massive implications and breadth of impact depending on what the problem is that's being solved. So when we talk about women entrepreneurs, we are truly talking about change makers. The women leading startups in Greece are revolutionaries in the current wave of startup fever, which is transforming the entire country into Greece 2.0. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Marina. Uh, three uh, inspiring and empowering presentations and stories. So before moving to Sofia and Ileana, I would like to ask our audience, all the burning questions you have, please put them in the Q&A and we'll make our utmost best to respond to them. Sophia and Ileana. All right, so thank you so much, Enrique and all our esteemed uh, panelists. Um, Ileana and I are just going to, to share a little bit about the uh, Boston Liquor Unidon and um, just to share and, and thank also Ileana. It's been, it's been wonderful to work with her uh, on this event. And I'm starting with that because um, before we kind of talk about the Boston Liquor Unidon in 2008, I was looking for something to do that was related to the Greek culture. And I ended up, uh, although living in, in New Hampshire, uh, I ended up finding something in Boston, Massachusetts and Cambridge specifically, the Boston Lycaon. So um, I started attending the Lycaon where I did meet Ileana also. And um, 
I'm starting with that, that, that part of the story is that meeting, uh, that being part of the Boston League of England basically gave me an opportunity not only to meet wonderful people and be uh, very much involved, but also to have uh, a lifelong friendship, as I would say. And that's why I kind of how I, I'm sharing that with everyone, which I'm very, very, you know, um, blessed to have. So um, at the Likio Limidon, uh, I know that our president shared a little bit about our mission earlier. There are a lot of different things that um, members can get involved uh, in uh, anything from dancing with a troupe, learning how to dance, uh, being involved in learning about more about traditional music, uh, being involved in finding out uh, more about the Greek language, uh, being involved with the attire and the decorative arts and learning more about the history, and also uh, being part of uh, one of the departments, which is uh, the one that I chair, also the Greek American women as preservers of the Hellenic folk culture and traditions. So we constantly try to to keep um, active and learning more about our culture and our traditions. And I'm going to pass it on to Ileana to talk a little bit more about what we do. Thank you so much, Sophia. Uh, thank you for the, the kind words. And also thank you to our amazing panelists. Uh, this was an incredible uh, opportunity to hear from uh, such distinguished uh, speakers on such diverse topics that at the end of the day, um, highlight the, the common threads uh, in women's history throughout uh, Greek history from ancient times on, until today. So uh, as Sophia said, um, we are, are sharing a few words about the Boston Likion Elinidon with all of you tonight, uh, just to encourage you if you are not familiar uh, with the organization, uh, to, to learn more. Uh, as Irene said earlier, we're very uh, known in the community for our dance troupe. We have um, dance classes and dance performances throughout the year that are even continuing uh, now over Zoom. So if you are ever interested in uh, practicing uh, some Greek dance steps or uh, you know staying active during uh, social distancing, please check those out. Um, but you know, even though we are based in Boston, as Sophia said, we are uh, here for all of uh, the states of New England and beyond. Uh, in this digital environment that we now uh, live in, whether we like it or not, I think we've um, discovered new opportunities to connect across borders. And I really hope that um, while uh, I really hope that we will connect in person very soon, uh, to dance and, and hold hands and, and enjoy music and wine and food together at Greek festivals and other events. I also hope that we'll continue to stay connected and host our virtual uh, trivia nights and uh, work together to assemble uh, pieces for the Boston Likyo Nalinidon blog uh, that are your favorite Greek traditional recipes or your uh, narratives about what Greek culture means to you. And so there are really many, many ways uh, to get involved. We welcome all of your support, all of your ideas, all of your contributions. And I'll just uh, point you to our website, bostonlikion.org, B-O-S-T-O-N-L-Y-K-E-I-O-N.org. Uh, once you're there, you can find our contact information, our social channels, and please uh, do get in touch. We look forward to staying connected with all of you. And thank you again for joining us tonight. So I will hand it back to Evriviki so that we can have a uh, conversation now uh, amongst all of us uh, about the themes and topics that we just heard about. So uh, um, I have uh, some questions for our speakers here. Uh, and I would like to start with Ioli. Um, so Ioli, in your exploration of women in Byzantine society, you made us acutely aware of legal rights and social status that were unconceivable in the contemporary West. So there, a woman's gender and marital status were the primary determinants of her legal standing. And here in the US, in the early history, state and national constitution included little mention of women who were expected to be dependent, subservient, and unequal. So quite a difference. So with this in mind, and in mind, you know, having in mind all those who 
currently support the demise of classics and humanities. Could you tell us why Byzantine studies and Byzantine women's studies are more relevant than ever? Well, this is not an easy uh, uh, question to answer. <laughs> um, Byzantium, as you know, has been sort of downplayed and looked at from the West as being a kind of Oriental society. Probably ideas as if it was almost like the Islamic world today where women have limitations in what they can do and not even drive in some places, you know. So uh, I think um, oh, from very early on, women had an important place in society in this Greek world to start with. You know, it was, it has its roots in the antique world, in the ancient world. We see there how important women were not only you know, in everyday life, but the arrangement of their gods, for example, you know, there are just as many female goddesses as they are uh, male ones uh, with very important roles. You know, you have even Artemis fighting, you know, doing all kinds of things. So there is already a tradition that women have a saying and they have a, uh, a place in that society. Um, and I think that has not been forgotten because in Byzantium, the ancient world lived, you know, in the myths, the stories, although we uh, have focused mainly on the religious sort of uh, texts and, and histories that we know of Byzantium and the icons that survive from circumstances because a church you don't take it down or icons you don't destroy but everyday life and the objects from that society were just sort of slowly you know, deteriorated, discarded, and so on, or destroyed. And so there's not much evidence of the other, what would be the cosmic side of, of Byzantium that was so different from the West in terms of equal rights and um, companionship within men and women and not the kind of hierarchy. Although the church makes us think of it <laughs> anyway. So that's all I can say right now. It has to have, you know, more, more research done to, to the sources that we have, even those that are visual ones. If you look carefully, you see details there that speak of the society. And now um, the, the images you shared with us and the stories, three generations passing the baton to the next generation and tradition, uh, uh, women, remained and have remained as uh, focal points in the transmission of culture and identity. So thank you, this is a most eloquent answer. And your answer uh, actually allows me now to ask all our panelists. So from these very strong women, and then the women such as uh, Paren and Greek entrepreneurs, uh, the question here from one of our audience is, the role of women among Greek immigrants, women who are the descendants of the original Greek immigrants, so second, third generation, are they different from other ethnic immigrant groups in the United States? Do you detect uh, differences? Yes, Maria. I keep forgetting to unmute myself, <laughs> which is very rare, and I, I always talk. So I, what is it about muting myself? Um, let me speak um, and let me play the uh, native informant, as they say in anthropology. I happen to be temporarily in Australia because of COVID, I need to be able to travel back home to Boston. But I'm also here temporarily because I am a Greek Australian. So speaking of, you know, immigrant communities, I, I can speak a little bit about that. Well, a Greek Australian American, I should say, it's three um, <laughs> um, uh, movements. Um, years ago, just before I went to California uh, uh, to do my uh, education, I had I worked to do the first um, Antipodes Festival, which is a cultural festival in Melbourne, Australia. Um, that's kind of like Spoleto in Italy. So we had the Ministry of Culture of Greece, Ministry of Culture here, putting together um, uh, funds to do this amazing um, festival, which 
had theater, it had art, it had Greece and the sea uh, artifacts, you know, shown in from the museum in Athens. Another element was the uh, textile. So Elmex, which is the uh, organization of um, textile in Greece um, and maintaining uh, like uh, the, 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 the tradition that Ioli was showing us, um, had sent material here. I was the project uh, director of that festival and I asked, I went on Greek uh, immigrant radio and I asked all the women as immigrants who had brought their prika with them, could they please, dis, you know, could they consider submitting it to this exhibition, which was initially only for what had come from Greece, from the museum and from LMX, but I wanted them to be part of that lived culture that Ioli is talking about. And there you could see that tradition of the three generations that Ioli gave us that amazing image of, where what I was seeing in Ioli's images, I was seeing what these women had brought with them and how that um, open call to come and represent themselves actually led to them doing um, textile companies and starting businesses of their own here in Melbourne from that exhibition and from that time. So both the historical context and the continuity that we've been talking about, but also that opportunity to represent, to look at the narrative and to see how one fits and make one's own narrative around it. I certainly think that uh, diaspora women have had a long history of plugging into that and continuing and doing their own. It was a long-winded answer, I know, but It's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, uh, the connection is it's obvious. And I think, Marina, uh, you you have really kind of same story, right? Uh, uh, with an amazing grandmother and now an amazing granddaughter, you? Oh, oh, well, yeah. My, I mean, my grandmother was an entrepreneur and uh, a refugee and an entrepreneur. And she was amazing. She really had an incredible story and she just did it it wasn't like someone told her to do it she just did it she had that motivation and nobody was going to stop her and which brings me to another question um what needs to change in the way society educates women and men to allow women to really drive uh, and thrive. It drive a country's economic ascent, such as in Greece, you mentioned, and thrive. Because I was thinking again of your uh, grandmother coming as a young refugee from Asia Minor to Greece and from then to the US. But was her success story also related to the educational opportunities she was offered here in the US? Because Ioli Calavresu, Maria Kundura, myself, Sofia, Iliana, we are first generation of people living abroad. And, you know, very often, you know, we are like you because we, we are open to ideas, etc. My own experience in Greece is that quite often this is quite suppressed. So what needs to be done to change this attitude? Well, I mean, the world is becoming so much more global and so um, the people's access, you know, any Greek woman's access to so much input, cultural, scientific, everything from all over the world now is just, it's at your fingertips, right? With a computer. So, um, you know, I would have said in the old days, you know, it's really important to travel the world. And I do think it's always important to see what's out there and to get educated. The US has an extraordinary education system, but it doesn't really even have to be. I actually have met several people now, um, two Greeks and um, a person in Mexico. Um, and in those three cases, they had extraordinary American accents that you could not detect that they were foreign born. And I asked all three of those, these are totally independent situations. And they said, yeah, I just watch American TV all the time. And so that I can pick up the accent. Well, they're not just picking up the accent, they're picking up 
the culture and they're picking up so much about the values in the states about entrepreneurship and enterprise and independence of thought. Um, so all so you kind of can't turn that off unless you know you're in a country where the internet is blocked or whatever. Um, so the good news is it, it you don't actually have to travel to get a lot of exposure and education. Thank you very much. So um, if you may, if I may add, yes, please, Mani. Uh, I think that, the, the, but what is also important, and I think Lady Mary's example is is a good one for this is one does not have to travel, but the being there for uh, that, um, you know, the being the eyewitness that she was in location um, where she could say, these are real Greeks that I'm looking at, not the, you know, classic Greeks represented in their translations actually does help because if that's what helped shift the between Orientalism and classicism, which is the discourse in her letters, you know, her work introduces the category of realist, realist fiction. Um, that's like a major change in the representation and then in the history of, of Greece and Greeks. So the being there is also important, um, says somebody who teaches travel literature uh, <laughs> to my students, um, because you also have to address uh, yourself being both uh, familiar and quote foreign at the same time in ways that is not possible through technology. So yes, it's amazing that we can do what we're doing right now, this conversation, but it's also important to be in situ, as Byron would say when he was trying to go and find Troy, right, in his letters. It's important to be there too. It is, it's so true because when you go, when you immerse yourself into a different culture and see how they react to you, it's, uh, it, it's very um, surprising in a way um, because you see, so, and, and that cannot be replicated. I, I agree completely. And, and I think we are all very grateful uh, for initiatives such as um, um, the Center for Hellenic Studies at Harvard um, offers scholarships to uh, students in Greece to attend the summer program. The Metropolis of Boston wants to have uh, Greek American children in Greece in order to have this full immersion in Greek culture. So educational equity and these opportunities for cultural immersion are tremendously important. Now, as a final point, because time is pressing, I have a question for all three of you. Now your learning, your professional, your personal journey is the fabric empowering stories are made of. You are resilient, you are innovative, and you remain open to new ideas and people. What is the message each of you would like to share with our audience, especially young females who are Zooming in this evening? Is it uh, a question that relates to being a woman or to being an active woman or being yes. An, yes. an interesting individual in the world today? Or Indeed, a change maker, uh, not a kind of passive audience, but uh, a contributor, a change maker, really, a revolutionary. <laughs> yeah. Well, to me, education makes uh, has a very important uh, place. Um, the more you can read, find out, uh, immerse yourself into something you find interesting, really, I don't know, prom helps you move into things that you like to do because you have to like also what you're doing to be able to succeed in it, right? It is not something that should be forced upon you, but with education, reading, it's much easier to find things to see and look and read than before. I think we have better chances to sort of uh, make it in life, you know, um, be more interesting, have, create a society that is more integrated, understands other cultures. I mean, that's also important that sometimes we had a more narrow sort of view of things. I lived in Germany and I have to say that I had very 
um, strange experiences of being a society that is much more focused on their culture than looking at outsiders. And I, I didn't like that very much. You know, I was, I had a strange name that didn't like it. Uh, they asked me if I could change it as a professor there, you know, things like that. And you say, what is happening? This is not, you know, this is the 20th century at that time, at least. So uh, I think with the means we have today, we should be able to become a society and women, I can see it, have already started to have uh, more to say and to do. I mean, just on television, you see how many more women report on sports that, you know, when I was growing up, no woman was ever was a reporter on soccer, you know, or something like that. I mean, that was impossible. It was, uh, so there, there are already changes and I see that. I don't know what else. I think education to me and an open mind and also an, an open mind and also being a uh, Perier, being uh, curious, right? curious, just a curious mind, you know, that helps a lot, I think. Thank you. Yes. Thank curious. you. This is in praise of books. And of course, Professor Calabreo has the biggest library in New England. <laughs> so, <Wow>. no, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so Three much. Boxes I haven't unpacked it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Marina and Maria. Final thoughts, concluding. Thoughts. I would say, I would say, um, um, being um, uh, being able to tell your story, um, finding the means to tell your story, to write, to write it for yourself, right, and to tell your story. Um, and why why is that important, and why is that? Because by telling your story, you are the change maker in the narrative and in the vision that you have by being told, by your story being told by somebody else, then you're the object of that narrative. So to be the subject, to be the agent of change rather than the object of change, the way I was distinguishing for Karen, right? They wanted to be both objects, not only objects, you know, we care about ed educating women, um, helping women in Greece, you know, in the late 19th century to do X, Y, or Z. They were also arguing as a collective, we also want to be agents of change. And there it's taking control of your narrative of your story. No matter what the means are and no matter what the story is, never think that there's a particular story to be told in a particular way, it's your story, right? And the means are your means and the content, the, you know, what are the elements of it is your story. So for me, that representation is the best advice I can give in terms of creating a path for oneself. Because as you weave it, thinking of the, all these beautiful, again, slides of the, of the tapestry, as you weave it, that's how you create community around yourself as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Maria. Marina. So um, I would say to really think about what you want to do, what you like to do, as Ioli was saying, you have to like what you do or you're not gonna do it well. Um, and then think about how you're gonna get there and what are the hurdles, what's missing in your own education that you, know, you have to fill in the hole, what's missing in terms of other resources, who do you, who can help you, who, who would be a good mentor, what other, what other pieces do you need and just plow forward and um, don't wait for permission. Don't wait for someone to tell you what you should wanna do. You really have to know that for yourself at the end of the day. And so deciding for yourself what you wanna do and then just figuring out a way to get there and not allowing failure to knock you down. Thank you. I love this. Uh, <laughs> so. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank uh, our three speakers, Yoli Calavresu, Marina Hatzopoulos, Maria Kondura, uh, Stratos Efthimiu, Irene Savas, Sofia Kusta Seliniana, <laughs> Sofia Kusta Seliniana Safka, and all of you who were part uh, this evening's discussion. As we mentioned earlier, this is the first um, of many events the Boston Liqueur Elimidon wishes to host. Join us, be part of our community, and be part of our conversations. Thank you, and good night.